is the Oddball Show, a podcast in collaboration with JP Live Productions and Oddball Magazine. Good evening, all you gophers and gadflies. Cooler than the other side of the pillow for your scorching summer night, this is indeed the Oddball Show. My name is Prof. I represent the Boston hip hop conglomerate known as JP Lime, and I'll serve as helmsman for this one hour's traffic of our airwaves. With me is my co host, the original Oddball himself, patron pen of the Odd, the Lost, and the Forever Searching, founder and editor in chief of Oddball. Uh-huh. Ooh, I'm so sorry. I just dropped out there. You, you, do uh, that, did you do that button thing you do all the time? I don't know what just happened there. But uh, founder and editor-in-chief of Oddball Magazine, please welcome Mr. Jason Wright. Uh, hello there. Uh, uh, what happened there, uh, just saying go, Prof? I, I don't know. Let's let's move on. All right, we'll move on. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, um, I'm here today. Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful day. Uh, it's Sunday. Uh, we're happy to be here. Uh, we have a great guest. Let's let's move on. We got a great guest. Here we go. I'm pretty excited for the show tonight, man. Thanks for being here. I'm fantastically, uh, fantastically uh, excited about the show. <laughs> fantastically. Our guest tonight is the senior story developer and a narrative designer for Story Arc Media, the children's entertainment brand behind the wildly popular game Pop Tropica. Fresh off the international launch of Pop Tropica Worlds and preparing to release the third of his Pop Tropica graphic novels in September. We'll discuss the joys and challenges of writing kids' media, we'll peek ahead to the growing future of the online game, and even take a journey back to his beginnings writing for the Boston Phoenix. One part Oliver, one part Octavian, please give a warm oddball show welcome to Mitch Kerpata. Wow, that was a really good intro. I hope I can <laughs> live up to it. Hey, thanks, buddy. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty good introduction, too. Hey, hey, thanks, man. I'm sorry that I interrupted yours with a little, little uh, mic button issue, but uh, I, you know, I, I like to make yours good too, bud. Well, it, I'm sure it was good. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> my, my introduction was pretty good too, so we're we're off to a blazing start. So. <laughs> well, as I mentioned in the intro, uh, Mitch, you are um, you hold a senior position at Story Arc Media, and in addition, you're the author of the Pop Tropica spinoff games. I want to make sure that we get to to talking about both of those, and there's a lot to talk about uh, there. So let's jump right into the game itself. Um, uh, I am a big fan and always have been of uh, RPG games um, going back to when I was a kid, to like uh, Monkey Island and some of the other Ubisoft games, uh, uh, The Sims, I love Myst, Assassin's Creed, Skyrim, all of that. So I, I think when we were talking about uh, you as a guest today, the idea of a children's version of that kind of game um, and one that's actually interesting and, and continues to grow was uh, pretty exciting to me. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what Pop Tropica is uh, and how kids actually uh, play this game? Yeah, definitely. And I'm glad that you mentioned Monkey Island because that is a real big influence on what we've done. Awesome. So Pop Tropica is an adventure game for kids. It's played online for most of its life. It was uh, a web game only. It's for the past couple of years been available both on the web and the app and in an app, you know, uh, Apple and Android. Um, it's a game where from a side scrolling 2D perspective, you enter what we call an island, which is a standalone quest that has a unique setting, unique characters, unique story. The only constant between the islands is you, the player. When you arrive there, you'll discover that there is some kind of a problem that the people on that island are just way too inept to solve themselves. And so you have to pick up the mantle and be the hero that that island needs in order to solve the quest. So you do that a few ways. Um, it's It kind of looks, if you just look at it, it looks like a, a Super Mario kind of a thing. You know, you run and you jump and you climb. But you also need to solve puzzles. You need to talk to characters. You need to figure out you know, what are the obstacles that are in your way which some are as simple as the door is locked can you find the key and some are more like this character you know really desires to be i'm making up not a real thing you know a famous <laughs> opera singer so can you find a way to get this character onto the stage to sing the opera and then you'll be able to advance that kind of a thing so uh it's you know it's funny it's it's not an action game it's not a twitch game it's a game that rewards close and careful play 
And I think mm. that for kids especially, there's not a lot of other things like that. So that's that's kind of my, my favorite thing about it. I think it's definitely uh, unique. It, uh, I tried to think of other games that it might be comparable to. Most of them obviously are like older, older age groups. I don't know that there is another one uh, that is similar. Uh, so I, th I think that's a really cool space to fill. Yeah, you know, usually the, the the sort of for kids especially, but kind of for everybody is you need to have these quick hit, you know, couple of minute gameplay experiences where you get a reward right at the end. And and that from as long as we've been around, which is almost ten years now, that's what people have said you should do. And we have made these kind of long form experiences that really require you to put in some time and some effort. And we've always found that our players are willing to do that. Oh. How how young is your like is your age group? How how early do they start? They start playing pretty early. I mean, I would say kids as I mean pre not preschool, but like a kindergartner can play it and enjoy moving the character around, but they probably won't get much more out of it than that. Yep. I would say the sweet spot is probably eight to twelve. That's where they're they're at the stage where they can read the dialogue, they understand that they're part of a larger story. Uh, and they still respond to the, you know, the the bright colors and the fun animation and all that stuff. I, I think that, you know, once you get older than that, you, you hopefully would still like it, but you may be more interested at that point in, you know, moving on to your PlayStation Four. Mm -hmm. My nephew is uh, <laughs> my nephew's six. He's playing Plants for Zombies. Uh, yeah. Are you ready for this game? Oh, yeah. that's a. I mean, that's a heck of a game. That's a, that's a game yeah. that. I mean, I like that game. It's kind of fun. Yeah, well, everybody likes that game. It's a crossover one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, like, kids can play that. Adults can play it. It's funny. It's intuitive. And there's some depth there. You know, that's a that's a very successful game. You know, you, you guys were talking about Sims earlier. And um, I I've, I used to be a very big video gamer when um, I – I mean, I had Nintendo Power. So let's go back to yeah. when, when that was when I was a video gamer. So uh, let's fast forward to PlayStation 2. Um, I just buy the Sims game. I'm like, cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this Sims game, and um, it was Sims Two, and I bought it used. Uh, same thing with uh, Madden. I bought that used, and that was broken. <laughs> so I, let's just say I never really got into video games after uh, Nintendo 64. I mean, I have. I'm playing the South Park game right now, which is very fun, and it's on um, Xbox uh, 360, which is very, very good. And and my friend also lent me his PlayStation Three. Uh, but you know, I, I just don't have the the time span for games. Anyway, so I mean, it's not not that I don't have the time span. It's just that I don't have. I'm just not good at them. Uh, <laughs> just not good at games. I don't know because. And the, here's the perfect example of me being not good at games. So the game Sims, right? Do you guys remember the game Sims? You guys are talking about that game. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so there's a part where it's really weird. You start uh, living with your mom, right? You do. Is that right? You start living with your mom. You uh, you're uh, throwing. Uh, trash like right outside like I couldn't throw the trash into the receptacle correctly So trash would build flies around my my trash can and I'm like why can't you just go the extra mile to put the trash in the trash can? Uh, so that was very very bad So I was playing this game for a long time trying to get good at it And then um, it's like you're losing money and you have to get a job, right? Uh, so my my characters are increasingly very uncomfortable and, by the way, that they <laughs> wet themselves and all kind of stuff, because that's what Sims do for some reason. So anyway, uh, so they wet themselves and they, they sleep at odd hours and you can't control them. I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about? Or... You sound like you were bad at Sims. Anyway, so so you can't control these guys, right? And so they're they're uh, they're sleeping at a. Uh, at off hours, they don't know how to throw trash correctly. The dishes are piling up. So anyway, I'm trying to get a job to figure out this game because I, I, you know, I want to, I want to proceed with Sims. Cause I heard you can live the life of, uh, of a Sims character. It's pretty cool, you know. I mean, uh, anyway. So my mom says I needed to learn some skills, so I start fixing the TV and uh, and uh, reading books. And uh, my character is growing increasingly uncomfortable. <laughs> it continues to wet itself. This is terrible. And, and so finally, um, I uh, I am going to to get a job. I keep on missing the chance. I'm, I'm not sleeping correctly. I mean. This character obviously has all sorts of issues. I don't know if it's because I don't know how to play the game, but you're controlling two people at the same time. Long story st short, I'm trying. Too late. No, oh, uh, oh yeah, it's a very long story. It's a good story though. So, um, 
I don't know. I had to quit the game when my stove got repossessed. My stove got repossessed for for a non-payment, and I didn't know how to go any uh, any further with the game after that. So wow. I don't know. Once my stove got repossessed, and I couldn't throw the trash correctly away, and I just kind of gave up. I don't know if you can actually succeed in Sims, but I don't. I think I failed like wow. pretty badly. They, and they say games can't be art. Yeah. Yeah, prof. Did you ever play Sims? Are you good at that game? Yeah, I play. I played Sims a, a, a lot. You know, I played. So it starts. Sims, the franchise started as Sim City. We won't get too far, too much further down this tangent. But Sims, Sims started as Sim City, the game. And then when they uh, released Sims, they had all the expansion packs and stuff. There was one point that I was playing in college, and me and my roommates would play. We made characters of ourselves, uh, and that went on a very, very long time. We all got to the top of our career fields. You know, we all. Uh, <laughs> One was an astronaut. One was like a, a master criminal, or you know, whatever. Uh, but I think The Sims is a lot of fun. I think that whole concept, and I think we'll bring it back a little bit here. That I think um, I don't think that, that is age specific. That idea of wanting to a world build, which uh, I know Pop Tropical Worlds has a little bit of that, um, as far as you know, upgrading your avatar. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Is it correct me if I'm wrong, Mitch? There's an island creator somewhere in uh, Pop Tropical Worlds. Um, uh, yeah, I saw that you have that book, the Island Creator book. Um, yeah, that's true. We wrote uh, an entire book about how to make a Pop Tropica Island yourself. Uh, that was like an activity book. Uh, what's interesting in Pop Tropica Worlds that is probably the most requested feature that we had for the first 20 years, 10 years almost, uh, which I can't believe, of <laughs> Pop Tropica's existence. People always wanted to have their own space. You know, they wanted their own house that they could decorate and upgrade and we never did it until pop tropical worlds and now you do get your own clubhouse where you can get decorations uh, from a wide variety of choices you can also earn trophies that you can put into your clubhouse and it's true that you know things like sims and like hopefully like having your own home in pop tropica are things that kind of cut across age and gender and gameplay lines like everybody likes having that thing that is theirs, they like having that feeling in a game that they're doing something unique, that they're having an experience within this framework players are not ha have not had, you know, that are unique to them. So is it, so you can get the game on uh, iTunes and uh, both Google Play? Yep, uh, and also on the web. It's uh, free to play. There is a, a monthly membership, which we hope people get. You get extra coins. You can get more stuff, but it's completely free to play. To play. And what I think is cool that I'm not sure if anybody else has done or not, I haven't looked that hard, is that it's completely seamless between all those platforms. So if you get the Apple, you know, if you get the version on your phone, on your iPhone and you play a little bit and stop, you can go to the website, go to poptropica.com, log in with the same credentials, and it will pick up exactly where you left off. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. It's wow. it's it's been almost it was almost like some kind of sorcery was happening when I was testing it because <laughs> it's always been a dream you know and, and and for some reason you know like Netflix can do it you know you can start a movie on your iPad and then pick that it up on your Blu-ray player but games for whatever reason I don't know if it's just there's more information or what you don't see it as much and it it works so well it's it's shocking to log into another you know to another computer or something and just be where you were. That's just because your developers are really good, right? I mean, they they're must be... amazing. Yeah, they're. Yeah. Uh, I should give a shout out. It's been both in house and uh, a company called Tricky Fast. Tricky Fast. The, the development, and they are they are geniuses. Um, wow. Three we just mentioned. That's cool. We just mentioned, uh, you know, Chop 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 Tropica World, um, and that's only been out a month. So that's the, the <laughs> giant expansion. Uh, on top of the original Pop Tropica, how long, you know, and that game is huge. I don't know how many islands there are, but I mean, 30, 40 on, on Worlds. Uh, I would say it's, it's about 50 something. 50 islands. I mean, that, that's a big game. How long were you all developing that, you know, before you were ready to launch? There were some starts and stops in the development of Pop Tropica Worlds, so it's hard to say. It's been about, about a year and a half, but within that, there were, you know, exploring down one avenue only to pull back and have to regroup and start again. So we've been, I mean, we've been working our tails off for about 18 months. Oh, wow. I guess I, I kind of figured it was actually time. longer than that. 18 months, huh? We did it much more quickly than 
we expected that we'd be able to, but we had to, you know, sometimes, sometimes you don't have a choice. So you put your nose to the grindstone and you get it done. So do you, do, do you write the script for the, for the video game? Yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly it. That's the, the main responsibility that I have is in that every Island has its own original story and it, it's it, all the, the accompanying characters and things that go with that. Uh, my main job is to write that is to figure out what story do we want to tell? on 50 islands on the original Pop Tropica, and now wow. <laughs> starting with two on the one we have, that's a lot of stories to tell. So we, we try to do as much as we can. We'll do fantasy, we'll do sci-fi, we'll do horror, we'll do some that are straight up comedy. Sometimes we get to adapt other books or other media. Like we actually did a uh, Great Pumpkin Island with all the huh, peanuts I characters. I saw that. Was, that was <laughs> unreal, man. Like, How did you see that? You're on the website, you can look at the different islands. I was yeah. looking on Amazon. I couldn't even bear to look at the book. I mean, they really tease you, so you got to buy the thing. <laughs> well, if you go on poptropica.com and play Pop Tropica Classic, you can get to all of those free islands, all of those dozens. It would be very hard to find one in particular because of how many there are. That um, is so cool. But yeah, I mean, you know, certainly I, I never would have thought that my job would take me to the point of I'm writing words that I'm now seeing coming out of Charlie Brown's mouth. <laughs> and it's, it's completely sanctioned, you know? It's, 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 Peanuts canon in a way. So do you do you have a, a team of writers or is it just, is it uh, is this is this, uh, is this just kind of a solo thing? Uh, it's mostly me. There we we've had uh, freelance writers in the past that we've worked with who have been great and contributed a lot. And I have worked a lot with Jeff Kinney as well. Um, yeah. You know, to try to develop a lot of these ideas and sort of get them to a point where we have a really good idea of what we're trying to do and and then. Then I will write the script, and then in the course of developing the island, the script will have to change a thousand more times because, you know, we might be suggesting something that is really too difficult from a programming perspective, or we might realize something that seemed really funny on the page doesn't actually work when it's in the game. So, you know, things change daily. I mean, everything's in flux. The script is the starting point, but for the most part, by the time an island actually ships, it's, you know... Ideally, the vision is true, but the actual details will have changed quite a lot. So, uh, so just going back, so you do you do you? Uh, what's a day like for you when you start the day? Do you uh, are you writing um, something and you give it to your developers to uh, go with, or uh, like how does it work? How does a developer get your script, kind of thing? Like how does this how does this relationship between a writer? and a developer kind of work because it's two different i mean it's both they're both very creative but one's one's a video game designer one's the writer for the video game so how does that work together uh it's 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 a challenge because everybody sort of speaks their own language right i mean we have i'm i'm the as the writer you know i i know video games very well but i really don't understand the technical stuff very well at all the developers right. they understand the code but maybe not necessarily the oh, i'm gonna say something really self-aggrandizing or something that i don't want to but <laughs> they, they the intricacies of being a writer <laughs> well i just mean you know they got into into computer science maybe because they didn't want to study english right like it wasn't their thing right, right. to read a book and then say this is what this book is really about because that's what i want from when you read the script i want you to agree with me that the script is what is about what I think it's about. And then you've got artists. You know, we have some of some really amazing artists who, I mean, my favorite stuff in Pop Tropica is usually stuff that the illustrators add on their own. But it's the same sort of thing, you know, that that we all need to make sure that we we're working toward a shared vision, even if we may have to make changes along the way in order to take what was on the script and turn it into reality. Yeah. So I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, very diplomatic, like, so when you did it this way, it wasn't quite the way I was thinking, and I'll take the blame for that, but change it. You know, yeah. it's a lot of back and forth. But also, you know, something like a, like a game, it, it has to be collaborative, and there has to be a point at, at which you say, you know, when people are coding it, for instance, there has to be a point the writer have to say, they're the ones who know how to do this. And you know, obviously, I'll, I'll I'll let them know what my opinion is, but also I've done my part, and it's their part now, and that you know they know better than I do what they're doing. Right. So, would would you say uh, that your personality comes through in the characters of Pop Tropica? <laughs> yes, I think so. 
Um, there are the the I don't know exactly how to put it. I, I once saw a, a tweet from a fan that said that it was a, a screenshot and the the person had said same old pop tropica and the picture was of a dumpster that had two boxes in it that were labeled hopes and dreams <laughs> <laughs> and i thought well yeah that's uh, that's pretty much it it's like a, a vanity project it's not like a vehicle for me to to impose anything on people but as the person who has done the most writing it's over the years it's Obviously, that's going to come through, and there is this sort of somewhat sarcastic. I mean, I don't think it's negative at all. I, I think that Pop Tropica is a really positive place, but it's also not like I see a lot of kids media where everything is hearts and flowers, cheerful all the time. And yeah, exactly. I mean, I, my favorite books and movies as a kid. I mean, they all had that dark edge, and I think that the the kids media that endures when you think about great books, you think about like where the wild things are, you know, you think about these things that have a little bit of an edge and they have a little bit of darkness. And and that is true of Pop Tropica, you know, it looks very cartoonish and it is, but it's not, it, it's not a, a sort of superficial experience. There, there's more there for the kids who really pay attention. So I'm going to take a guess on the, on the meaning of the name Pop Tropica uh, because there's a lot of pop culture references, <laughs> right? And okay. uh, it is in a tropical location. Am I correct? Uh, somewhat. It was actually a little bit of the, the cart before the horse because we were going to call it Poptropolis. And the pop part is basically that, you know, it's a fun sounding word. It's easy to pronounce. It does have that kind of, you know, pop culture, popularity, whatever. Yeah, it does uh, actually. Yeah. At the time that we were close to launching, Nickelodeon came out with a virtual world called Nicktropolis. Uh. And we, if we do Poptropolis, Nickelodeon is going to come after us. So we threw out a bunch of ideas, and Pop Traffic is the one we liked. And sort of because of that, when we had this one very small adventure, we said, well, let's just make it an island, and that way we can put hard boundaries on it. It kind of fits with this tropic thing in our name. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. then, so it wasn't planned at all, but then that ended up being a very core element of our identity is that these Pop Traffic islands are self-contained. And originally... The entire game was going to be continuous. Okay. Yeah. And if it had been Poptropolis, maybe it would have been, but instead it's these discrete islands, and that has ended up informing the fiction of the books. And, you know, everything we've ever done has all come from that. And it's because we were afraid of Nickelodeon. That's, <laughs> that's a pretty awesome origin story. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta tell you. And it's and it's cool that not only not that you rolled with it and you, you know, you obviously gotta you gotta find a new name when, once you hit an obstacle like that, but that then you use that to inform the identity and the structure of the game, I think is pretty cool. I mean, it, yeah, it goes to show you how much of this kind of a project is not necessarily a master plan, but more about, you know, spinning plates, really. Just, like, keep it moving. Just just do whatever yeah. it takes to get to the next step, to get to the next thing. So so um, I, I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, I, it sounded like Prof was just about to say something. Prof, were you about to say something? Yeah, I got a couple, but you go ahead. Uh, I was just, well, mine might change the whole nature of the conversation, but um, anyway, I just wanted to, it might, I don't know, it could. <laughs> but I just wanted to say, um, so Pop Tropica uh, kind of, um, I mean, how did, I, well, first of all, for, to our listeners who don't know, um, Jeff Kinney, who is uh, the diary of a wimpy kid, is uh the, is like what the co-creator with you in this pop tropica right yeah so like how did that like come to be how did how did jeff go from diary of a wimpy kid which uh is a like a pretty big book series to a, to a video game it's it's bigger than pretty big it's yeah uh, i mean i don't know I'm, I'm, I'm a, i mean i actually saw the, the movies i thought they're I, I, they're very very entertaining except for I, I don't think the third one was but i didn't see it so uh not really bad yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually see it, but I, but me and my wife saw both uh, the the diary of a wimpy kid. Uh, I thought they were very entertaining, but the book, the books, like it's like a huge, it's a huge huge thing. So how did, um, <clears throat> how did the diary of a wimpy kid uh, Ill come into Pop Tropica? Uh, so before Jeff had published any books, he was an employee of our company, which at the time was called Family Education Network. We have since been purchased and changed our name, blah, blah, blah. But uh, at the time, he 
was a, a, a shockwave programmer, like pre-Flash. Uh, oh, wow. He made he made educational games. Yeah, this was early two thousands. He's so, a programmer. Yeah, so, and some of some of the games that he made for FunBrain.com, that was the educational game site they had, are are still there. They've been redone, I think, in HTML five. But uh, if you go to FunBrain.com and play a game called Penguin Drop, that was a Jeff Kinney original. Uh, but so that was wow. his job, you know, and and he pursued his creative projects on his own, as a lot of us do. And basically came to the head of the company one day and said, listen, I have this project I've been working on. It's it's kind of a, a cartoon novel hybrid. And, you know, I think it would be good to publish on FunBrain. So the Fun head of the company, yeah, FunBrain.com is where this yep. started. So the head of the company took a look at it and said, this is actually really good. Why don't we publish this on FunBrain? And so uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid premiered on FunBrain.com before it was ever a book in uh, uh, 2004, maybe, something like that. Really? And they, yeah, and they published it daily. So they kind of published it in real time as Greg Hepley's journal. Uh, and, oh, wow. And so Jeff was still, you know, it was, it was very popular, but Jeff didn't get yeah. any more money off of it or anything at, at that time. And he continued to do his job. We decided mm -hmm. at some point that Fun Brain, being the educational games, was getting a little long in the tooth. So it was time to start thinking about a fun brain too, you know, something that was educational and fun, but maybe a little bit deeper. Maybe you would get your own avatar. Uh, and, and it, you know, this project that became Pop Tropica, this all kind of came out of Jeff's head. Really? really? And as it happened, he got a publishing deal for Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And the first Wimpy Kid book came out the same year that Pop Tropica came out. And oh. they, were, they were both wow. runaway successes. And the, wow. the, the difference was that. Jeff, may, he had retained the copyright to Wimpy Kid. So he became wealthy overnight, but continued to work his day job with us and, and really for way longer than you ever would have expected for somebody who has built this empire. He just continued to work for us too. I mean, his schedule changed a lot, but he he cared. You know, Pop Tropica was, was as important to him as Wimpy Kid was, and he, he stayed involved for a very long time. He is still, he just is... At this point, I think finally much more focused on with the kid than on Pop Tropica. You'd say five, Pop Tropica has uh, over, I don't know, I think it was a ridiculous number of, of, of users. Uh, 50 yeah. milli, million? More than that? 50 uh, million? It depends on how you want to slice and dice the numbers. Um, we've, we've had well over 500 million avatars. Oh, 500, 500 but, avatars. Holy yeah. cow. That might be low at this point. It's probably not that much higher. Uh, I, I could not tell you how many kids have played Pop Tropico over the years. It's it could be a hundred million. It's not definitely a hundred million. That's incredible. That's at incredible. Our, yeah, I mean, it, it's it, there was a time. It, it's definitely not as cool now as it was. Like if I go to a school, I'll, I'll sometimes do appearances in middle schools, so and I'll say, "Who knows Pop Tropica?" And you know, a dozen kids will raise their hand. In like 2010, if you went to a middle school and said, who knows Pop Tropica, every single kid would raise their hand. It was the biggest site in the world for a while for kids. Now, these graphic novels that you're that you're putting out now, uh, these are these are the uh, pretty like these are also expansions of Pop Tropica uh, that will become part of the video game. Or are they part of uh, their I mean, are they like going to be are they just like stories of the video game or are they in the video game? They are, they're related, but separate. It's sort of like they, they start from the same basic idea, which is an area of the ocean where these different islands are that are seemingly from different places and times. Uh, but, the, but the story is completely different. In a way, it's like, it's like planting two seeds and one turns into Pop Tropica the game and one turns into Pop Tropica the graphic novel series. Um, we, we did make an adaptation of the first book in the graphic novel series that you can play on poptropica.com, which kind of follows the plot of that. But since then, the the series that I sent, that was the first book, which I did not write, but I have written the next three of the four book arc. And if that goes in its own direction, and there's nothing on the in the game that that uh, parallels what I've done in the books. I, I saw the uh, on, online the Pop Tropica um, on Amazon. I was looking at Pop Tropica 2, and it's in Spanish. How, is it in many different languages? It is, and 
it's funny that they don't really ever tell me any of that. A, a, a box will show up at the office and, and we'll open it up and it's like the Greek version. <laughs> That's awesome. Ah! <laughs> and I, I, I don't actually know how many languages the series have been published in, but uh, most European countries, I think some some Asian countries, like way more than I thought, way more than I would have expected. I've seen Portuguese, Spanish, Greek, French, uh, uh, either German or Dutch. I think Dutch. It's, I don't know, like more than I thought, honestly. Again, like I had the opportunity to pick up the book series because the person who wrote the first book wasn't available. And again, I just just went ahead with it because it, it was something, you know, it was a, a task that I had to do and I did not foresee that I would see the Greek version come in. It was just crazy. Well, I, th I think the game, I mean, the, the books are a really interesting uh, continuation slash spinoff. Uh, and I think what, what I was going to say earlier, actually, come, we'll come back around to that, is that in the books, I'm able to see that obviously that, that point you made earlier about injecting your own, your own personality comes through. Because like one of the things that I noticed was a sense of humor that is not necessarily not, you know, the kids who read it are not necessarily going to get it, you know. You, in a, in a, the um, the lost expedition one, I'm pretty sure, and they're trying to get back to the ship. Uh, you make a you make the I believe I can fly reference, which is our <laughs> Kelly. Can we all just get along? Which is uh, Rocket yeah. King. At, at one point, one of them is envisioning uh, she's on a ship and she's envisioning them all seeing the she the sea shanty Barrett's privateers, which I and I I find that kind of um, I don't know quirky isn't the right word, but that kind of sense of humor. Uh, awesome. I think that that's really funny. I, I think that I probably do that. Somebody pointed out to me not long ago that I do it in front of kids that I'll make jokes that aren't really for them, but to them, you know, that yeah. uh, including them in that kind of thing is, I don't know, interesting and idiosyncratic, but I think uh, it also lends itself to the style of, of what you've been crafting that, you know, it's, it's not just hearts and flowers and it's not just kid stuff that there's a, an interesting connection to pop culture but and and uh i don't know those references to me were all pretty interesting well i i hope so yeah and and part of that there, there's a couple different reasons for things like that part of it is that i think if i tried to pretend that i knew what the kids were into today that they would see right through me mm -hmm. <laughs> part of it is really hoping to broaden that audience that if the parent picks up the book they're getting something out of it right and and whether i don't know if this is really all that worthy of a goal but you know, uh, like probably both of you, I've watched, I don't know how many thousands of hours of The Simpsons in my life. And the number of times in my life that I have seen something and said, that's what that joke was. On yes. The yep. You know, that's what that was. Like, I, I love the thought of a kid having that experience with Pop Tropic. You know, like a kid, Lost Expedition, will say, okay, Maya thinks she's going to be collegially singing a shanty with these kids. Okay. I mean, with the sailors. Okay. And then later in their life, they're going to actually hear that song and go, wait a minute. That's a exactly. real song. And, and wait a minute, there's actually references to that musician all over the book. You know, like I, I hope that, that it spurs that kind of a curiosity and that sort of, you know, that, that kind of cross disciplinary thinking that is not really in vogue these days. Have you ever done any Star Wars references? I know you're a huge Star Wars fan. Uh, probably I have, although I can't think of one. I'll tell you what, uh, to, to take it, the, the, the first book in the series was written by a guy named Max Brellier. That's not the name that's on the cover because he had to use a pen name for reasons that are very kind of boring. But he's written a couple <laughs> series of his own. He wrote a series called Galactic Hot Dogs. <laughs> Another middle grade kind of graphic novel action adventure. And if you want Star Wars references, that's the one to go to. It's basically his attempt to write Star Wars for kids. And it's it's very fun and very funny. I saw that actually. That's uh, Story Arc Media does that one too, right? That's right. Yeah, that's it's all part of our... So basically the, the company made, you could say, a large mistake by not retaining the copyright to Wimpy Kid when they published <laughs> it. They, they let Jeff hold on to the ownership and it now is worth hundreds of millions of dollars, which is far more than our company is or has ever been worth. So <laughs> their, their hope has been to try to build up some new IP that, that we can own. And certainly nothing has been as big as Wimpy Kid, but nothing ever is. So a lot of the work for, um, for your, uh, for well, the, the company, or is this, this illustrator specific to um, Pop Tropica? 
I missed the first part of uh, your question. Uh, I, uh, the the illustrator for Pop Tropica. It's uh, uh, is, is this person uh, specific to Pop Tropica or? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, the illustrator in the books is a guy named Corey Merritt, who is a ridiculously talented drawer. I didn't want to say illustrator again, but that just sounded horrible. Uh, no, he worked on a he worked on a contract basis for us. He's, he's spectacular. Uh, he has, you know, obviously his very own style. If you read the books, you'll see that it it you can tell that it's similar to the style that you'll see in the game, but it's it's also much more personal and idiosyncratic. I mean, when you're making a game, you have several artists who have to stay on style, so there's a lot yep. more enforcement of just you know things i don't understand people are like oh your line weight's all wrong this isn't right whereas cory Merritt, as the sole illustrator of the book got to bring his own sensibility to it and thank god for that because he i felt like he bailed me out so much when i i would kind of write myself into a corner and think you know i don't know if this page is going to work i don't know if this joke is going to work and i would just write something like Funny face and send it off, and then I would get it back from Corey, and it's you know he nails it, and he completely made the joke work when it didn't work on the page. But that's kind of that that same collaborative element that you were talking about before, right? That you have to allow that space if you're working with different artists, and especially different artists of different media, uh, that you know it's not going to go exactly as you write every word because then there would be no space for the other artists to fill in their own, you know, yeah, yeah, that's exactly put their own right. touch. I have observed other kinds of of those kinds of collaborations, and I know that there are people out there who really have a, a vision, and they really say this has to look exactly like it does in my brain, and I'm going to give you all these various notes and and everything. And and that's not how I have worked with Corey. And part of that is that he is just that great, uh, but it's also that you know I I really think my job is to put it on the page, uh, you know, in 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 the script, and his job is to put it into the pictures. I would say, you know, not that I never had notes or never had things to say. Of course I did, but most of the time, honestly, when I would get his sketches, I would just think, man, this is this is better than I could have imagined. I love this. It's like I'm seeing it for the first time. That's awesome. Uh, this is incredible. Do you find that um, – well, two questions I want to ask about your, your, your market here, your kids' market. One is do you find that kids – that are into Pop Tropica and especially the books, because the mix the books have kind of a, a mystical I don't know mystical is the right element, right word to talk about, but uh, like, you know the secret societies and then time travel is the one that's coming out in September, which I think is super interesting. And uh, as another tangent, I think that it's super interesting that the kids are correct me if I'm wrong, in end of time are discovering that the original Pop Tropica is when they're traveling from the islands, they're traveling through time. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think that's, yeah, that's cool. Pretty interesting. Is that, is that a spoiler? Did you just spoil something? No, nah, I think that's always implied. Oh, okay. Right. I mean, it's from from book one. It, they're wondering. They're seeing things that are out of time. Oh, cool. Um, so do you find that your target audience of kids are into, like, you have a lot of crossover with a Harry Potter audience, for example, because uh, they're, interest, they're interested in quirky or interesting concepts, uh, mm -hmm. or not really? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I hope so. You know, I, I've had the chance to meet a lot of kids who have read and liked the books. Although, you know, that it's funny. It's very weird to meet a kid who thinks that you're a star. You know, I, I <laughs> do remember when you were a kid, like an author would come to your school or something, and you'd just like, I can't believe this famous yeah. person is. And when it when it's you on the other side, you're like, dude, I'm just like, or go to the office today. You know, I. Not not that cool. Um, so I don't know who I don't necessarily know who the kids are. That like I know who I I hope they are, but in a way I just sort of I, I almost write for myself as a kid. Right. You know? That's and I, I hope it's kids who are interested in in big ideas. You know, that ideas about the nature of existence, which is kind of highfalutin, I know, but that is also why we read and write books, and you're never too young for that. So, uh, how did you uh, get into uh, writing um, for for Pop Tropica? Is that like how did that happen? I mean, um, well, it's, yeah. I mean, I've always been interested in writing. I majored in 
writing at college. I mean, it was basically English, but they had a much longer name for it so that they could charge more probably. Uh, <laughs> uh, but my, my career path basically took me to this company, Family Education Network, where I got a job as an or something on uh, two websites that they had called familyeducation.com, which is a parenting website, yep. and teachervision.com, which it's a teaching website, you know, a website for teachers. So yep. you know, it was, it was a, a very basic low level job. It was like, post this article on our website, make sure that it's formatted correctly, all that kind of stuff. And the, the company had funbrain.com at the time, but uh, you know, I wasn't a part of that. But as I got to know the people at the company, uh, and as at the time I was uh, reviewing video games, they started to to say, all right, well, this guy seems pretty smart, He's doing a good job on this on this these two sites that he works on, and now we have a project that probably needs somebody with some kind of video game knowledge, and we don't yeah. have any budget to hire new people, so why don't we get this guy we already have on the payroll to come work on this? And, <laughs> and that was pretty much it. I mean, I helped. Uh, I was in the, the the room where we decided what Pop Tropico would be. We met in a very depressing windowless conference room at a <laughs> at the Pierce building in Copley Square, like once a week for several months, and finally yep, yep. got the thing off the ground. And uh, it took off right away. So at that point, they did have to hire a lot of people. And so I kind of went back to my normal job because they hired dedicated people. But again, it just kept growing and growing. And they just kind of thought, we, we need more people on this. We just need, we need bodies on this. And uh, just by virtue of that, by virtue of the work that I did and the, the relationship that I, I started to form with Jeff Kenny and they just kept giving me more chances to prove myself. And by uh, 2010, that's, that was good enough. And they, they said, we need somebody to write this stuff. How about if it's you? <laughs> um, I know we gotta, I know we gotta go into a, a break for a second, but I just gotta say, what's it like to watch something like that grow? It's, when you don't have a frame of reference, it just seems normal. Like it was so popular, so fast that we just were like, of course it is. We know this is great. You know, you almost, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, not that we weren't amazed, you know, not that you don't look at something like seeing, I, I think the best day we ever had was 1.5 million unique kids on the site in a day. Wow. Yeah, but that, that's such a big number, it's hard to, to really grasp it. Uh, you know, but it's also it's also you sort when, when you have that much success that soon, it does kind of feel like well, of course, well, right? Of course, we're successful. Yeah. Anybody would do this. You know, that turns out not to be the case. Do you find? Do you think that's a um, a characteristic of? I wanted to ask in a second. Challenges and joys of, of writing for children's media, but do you think that that kind of um, uh, gold rush kind of feeling is bigger with children's media? Be you know where something can take off and then become the biggest thing in a certain age group or, or for kids as a whole? Do you think there's a, 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 a hotter streak kind of thing with children's media or no? Yeah, yeah, the kids kids are fickle, you know. If they like, if one kid likes something, suddenly everybody likes something and they will move to the next thing. The, the number of competing games and sites that have come and gone over the past 10 years, you know, I, I've lost count. We used to worry about Webkins and Neopets, and then we were worried about Club Penguin, and now we worry about Animal Jam, uh, you know, because kids will just flock to whatever is, is yeah. new and cool. I mean, they, they do, but at the same time, if you're giving them something good, which I think we have, I mean, to, be, to have been around for 10 years is very unusual. And you, and you can continue to grow and change, obviously, you know, that you're, yeah. you know, a very staple of being a uh, of sales is is getting return customers so if you're you know if your kids play all the way through the game uh then you know they're, they're not gonna there's, there's nothing for them to come back to necessarily but you guys have been adding and adding to this world that you're creating uh in a you know in a way that we said earlier that was, is pretty unique so i mean that's gonna yeah, work to your benefit a little bit you would think so somebody shows up at pop traffic today having never seen it before they, they might even be overwhelmed by the amount of stuff they can do. That's true, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, quickly, before we do get into, we want to take a quick break and talk about the what's going on at JP Lime and, uh, and Oddball. But yeah. what, are you, what are some of the unique, this is the last question I'll ask before the break, is... Um, I got one, too, and then we'll, then we'll go into the, the break. Okay. Sorry, well, yeah. no, you, you can go first. Go ahead. Oh, my question is, have you ever beat the game? <laughs> 
Well, the, we we don't have a, a an end state really in, in the sense that a lot you know a more traditional game would do. I have I have played every island to completion. So you beat the games. <laughs> in, in a sense, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can still play it. It doesn't end. Oh, oh, wow. that's cool. So you can't beat the game. No, so you can't not really. You, you never get to a point where the credits roll. Oh, it's not like that part in Zelda when you have to take the picture and send it to Nintendo Power. That's what I remember. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, when you get to those credit scenes and games, you know there's, there's post credit stuff. You got you got to stick around, man. Uh, yeah. If you want those chivos, you got to make sure there's nothing after the credits. <laughs> That's some video game jargon I didn't get. <laughs> um, so the last thing I was going to ask is, what do you think? You know, it's it's obviously a pretty specific market, and it's a pretty. Um, it's not just like making any game or any book, what do you think are some of the particular challenges to writing children's media? Challenges and or, you know, what are some of the the joys or, or ways that it becomes easier writing for a children's uh, media? Hmm. Wow, there, there are very many of those, those things. Um, you know, it, it's funny because I, I feel like I do sort of, I know that I'm writing for a child audience, but I don't feel like I'm writing down to kids. You know, I, yeah. I, what I like about writing for kids is that I think that kids really do have an, an earnestness and an openness to, again, like big ideas. You know, I think that if you, if you write it for teenagers, they'll be suspicious of you if you're trying to, you know, to communicate something big. You know, they'll say, who's this guy? What is he know, He's phony. But a kid really will go with you on that ride you know and, and, and they still are believe me very very critical and they will let you know if you screwed up or if you didn't do a great job uh, but i just find that that age you know and when i think about stuff that i read and stuff i watched when i was in that, that eight to twelve year old range i never heard that i did that you know i really i yeah. went along and bought in and i like writing for an audience that i think is going to buy in i think that's that's really fun as far as challenges i mean it would be fun to be able to swear, I guess. Uh, but but in a way, I, I feel like I, I almost do write a, a, almost adult style stuff. I think there's there's adult style stuff in there that I'm trusting the kids to get. Right on. And that was actually one of my corollary questions: was is it? Uh, do you think it's it's easier or harder? You know, a because the kids are more open to those bigger ideas, or harder because they want to necessarily understand them. But that definitely that that answers that question. That. Uh, I like the idea that writing for an audience that's going to buy in uh, makes it exciting as a writer. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Well, actually, that's a, that's a pretty good place for us to take a quick break here. Um, so we're on with uh, Mitch Capata, uh, the the brilliant mind, one of the many brilliant minds behind Pop Tropica, the game, Pop Tropica Worlds, the game, and the brilliant mind behind uh, the Pop Tropica graphic novels series. Um, we'll... We will, as we do in every podcast, be putting all the links up in our pertinent links section. You um, can find the podcast running concurrently at uh, jbenineproductions.com and oddballmagazine.com. And on both sites, you'll have a, a set of links so you can get to a the Pop Tropica site, uh, Mitch's avidly updated personal site. Uh, <laughs> go, Mitch. Uh, <laughs> where, you right can, the where you can reach uh, Mitch on Twitter, all of that will be up there. Um, uh, so you can get plenty of information and get yourself playing on Pop Tropica. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the Oddball Show here is a collaboration between JP9 Productions and Oddball Magazine. Every show, we like to keep you updated on what's going on with our respective websites. Uh, Jason, would you like to go first or second, sir? Uh, what do you want to do? Uh, well, I'll go first. I'll go first and I'll be brief. All right, all right go ahead. Ready? All right. So... Uh, Jason Productions. What the hell was that? <laughs> go, go ahead, do it, do it. All right. <laughs> this is what's going on at jpilineproductions.com. Um, JP Line Productions is a Boston hip hop magazine, and our uh, site is, is JPL Magazine, where we keep you updated on your role with the Crunchy Hip Hop Center. Uh, what we got going on this week, our good friend DJ LSP who was responsible for the beats on Blue Star Boulevard and many of our other productions, uh, 
uh, in JP Lime. It does a weekly series called LSP Throwback Thursday or LSP TBT, where he goes through his um, his beats and his songs that he's made and posts one up every week for our freestyling listening pleasure. Um, you can you can find that every week up on the website. You can also follow him on Twitter, SoundCloud, and other social media sites. But you can check out this week's uh, LSP Throwback Thursday called Clarification Two. Nice uh, upbeat, funky jam. Uh, that one's up there. He's also the uh, responsible for our theme music here at the Oddball Show. So shout out to our good friend DJ LSP. In addition, we um, at JP Nine Productions, you can find all of our music from Blue Star Boulevard and uh, Lime on the Rocks, our two uh, JP Lime albums. Those are easily accessible from the website. In addition, our monthly um, hip hop history video series called the Rap Flashback. You can find that every month. They obviously have the June edition up there now. Um, that's written and and written by our friend Scholar and produced by the JP Lime crew. So you can find that up there. Um, in addition, we're going to be doing some upcoming profiles on local hip hop artists. That Boston has a, a a positively booming hip hop scene right now. So there's a lot of artists for us to be interested in and talking about. So that's going to be coming up pretty soon. Um, we also do all kinds of stuff on sports and politics and social issues. So please come check us out at jplimeproductions.com and follow us at jplime on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. And Reverb Nation and SoundCloud. Are you on Reverb Nation? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. That's how our music gets to – that's our distribution. That's how we get to, to Spotify and iTunes, where you can also find our music, and Amazon MP3. Uh, I got to say, other sites. I love Blue Star Boulevard. It's a great album. Thank you very much, man. We're pretty proud of it. Uh, There's some uh, videos. You guys videos. Yeah, I mean. I've seen them. That's true. And you can also find music from our new, uh, coming under the, the JP Lime umbrella, uh, the new hip-hop duo, hip -hop duo, Tyler Durden. I like that. I like Tyler Durden. There's some info up there. You got some upcoming shows. Uh, they're going to be hitting up. They We are going to be hitting up uh, Opus Underground with Justice Bourne up in the north end of Boston this week. So, um, we're posting cool. pictures and video from that. Uh, but yeah, yep. so we yeah. are J Pilam, your world with the Crunchy Hip Hop Center. Please come check us out. And that. Uh, what's going on at J Pilam? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I, it's uh, such a great uh, website. I love your, uh, your stuff there, uh, Prof. It's so good. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> it's just a love fest here at the Oddball Show. That's how it always is, man. It really is. I mean, we have we have a good time collaborating. I think it's just fun. It's fun. So, what uh, you guys got going on this week? Uh, we have so much content going on. We uh, we have our usual columnists. Um, we have Wise Words with Bruce Wise. There are so many references to Bruce Wise's poems that uh, that that Chad just couldn't even he didn't even tag me. He's like, just you gotta read these. There's 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 like 50 references to I don't know. I'm just gonna go into them real quick. Let's see, Casio Sato. Uh, let's see, uh, es Nassim Nicholas Talib, Kazakh city capital, Nazar beef, gold egg upon the tree of life, exposed at white grave. These are all um, things that are referenced in the Bruce these Wise. Are all, yeah, so Bruce Wise is probably the coolest uh, pickup that we've ever had at Oddball Magazine. He basically does these uh, vignettes where he talks about like stuff that's going on in, in current media um, and also like like Greek mythology and like Chinese philosophy and like uh, it's just he's really incredible. He's been an incredible person to work with. I don't know where this guy's brain comes from, but it's really pretty, uh, inspe pretty special. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just, I don't know, Prof. Do you mind if I just read one? Um, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just gonna read it. I'm just gonna read it because this is just how he is. So uh, he takes his his um, his name and he changes it around. Uh, so his name is Bruce Wise, but he takes his middle name and his. His, his, his full name, and he makes little names out of them. So um, here is one called, uh, let's see, The Passing of a Chancellor. No, I'm, uh, Public Theater in the Dark by, okay. Public Theater in the Dark by Cobb Edius Real. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. William Shakespeare. In public theaters, free Shakespeare found in Central Park, 
This year, Julius Caesar is a play that's made its mark. The Donald Trump like Caesar has gold locks and wears long ties. Calpurnia is draped in Peel's Slovenian reprise. The poet Cena is attacked and murdered by the mob. The whole a rather strange concocted irony kebab. Because the drama shows similitudes to brutal truth, assassinations by the actor, hints of John Wilkes Booth, the tyrants has become a god, republic overthrown, an ever-present threat of mob dictatorship is shown. That's just Bruce. That's just so Bruce puts up four poems on his on uh, for for his column. It's incredible. So uh, I love Bruce Wise. His uh, stuff's pretty amazing. And that was just Bruce. So uh, we also have you know the Bamboozle No More column with Janet Cormier, the Somerville poet and artist. J uh, James Van Loy, the mainstay cosmic spelunker poet from the last. I don't know, since 1985, it's all one thing. Then we have a newcomer poem by John Gray with photography by Nicholas Smith, and uh, also another poem by Bruce McRae with, I think that's uh, art from uh, Allison Gold from California. And then uh, we have our favorite, Liza Zayas from the Underground Garden, and she's talking about the Solstice Celebration, which is a uh, EDM uh, dance electronic. Uh, uh, I mean, she does all these uh, underground uh, EDM shows and it's this uh, solstice celebration uh, that's uh, in Boston this month. Um, and then, uh, uh, Mitch, you might like this. Uh, the the Epic Autism Review with Flemings uh, is he uh, talked about the uh, E three. Have you heard of that, Mitch? Uh, yeah, that was, uh, the video game show. Yeah, yeah. He so yeah, he first, so, so he uh, he wrote a um, he wrote his opinion about who who won between Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, and overall, he says, I feel like Nintendo was a clear winner of E3 with Sony coming in second. Nintendo did a great job of reminding people that you don't need a super expensive or powerful system to enjoy great games. Sony did a great job of reminding people that their ecosystem is the home for great exclusives. Microsoft, on the other hand, did a poor job of convincing people they need to buy a $500 system just to enjoy games. And that was Fleming's um, overall point, but he broke down each uh, part of um, the E3. And then um, I had my poem, Jagged Thoughts, what, number 180, Prof. 180 poems have been up on this site, and this is Jagged Thought 180. And I'll read it at the end of, the, end, at the, end of um, the program. And then, you know, we had our comic strip, The Odds, by Bill Harvey, and uh, a poem by Jimmy Pennington with photography by Glenn Bowie. And that was just this week. So we have a lot of content at Oddball Magazine. You got to check it out. It's uh, basically the dopest poetry plant, uh, poetry on the planet. So it's true. That's that's a verifiable fact. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's science. That, <laughs> it's science. <laughs> so that's what's going on. Uh, all right. Yeah. You know what? I got to get this. Uh, anyway. Our music guy. That's is fired. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's music director is fired. <laughs> 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 so that is what's going on at jpodinproductions.com and oddballmagazine.com. Please come check us out and check out our plethora of, co of content, especially on the oddball end. Um, Dude, they really so do crank out some great poets. They're very interactive with all the, the uh, poets in the Boston scene, especially Stone Soup Poetry, which goes on every Monday night. is hosted by our good friend Chad Parento. Yep. See a lot of those same poets carrying over between Stone Soup and Oddball Magazine, so it's really a, a great site for you to go check out, be part of the local art scene. And uh, shout out to Chad. Uh, Chad is uh, the the driving force behind Oddball Magazine. We love him over at Oddball. So yeah, come check us out. Come join us. Come follow us. Come be friends with us. <sighs> we need friends. Um, so as does happen uh, here at the Oddball show, the hour tends to fly right by us when we're having a good time, we're having a good conversation. So uh, the second half will obviously be, be a little shorter than the first half, but I do want to get in, uh, Mitch, to a little bit about your your background and your history as a writer. I know that, um, as I mentioned in the intro, one of the places you got started was writing for the Boston Phoenix. Um, and I know Jason had a couple questions about that, but can you just, uh, can you tell us how you ended up at the Phoenix and how that may have... Uh, I don't know, either re Probably relates to your love for video games or informed your later work with video games. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I always loved video games. You know, uh, when I was, I want to say three or four, we got an Atari 2600. That's when I started. Yeah. So, you know, I went through it all. I went through Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, everything. You know, it was basically, the, for, for good or ill, the focus of my teenage years was playing video games. And, uh, 
ended up eventually having to get a job right after college as as you tend to do and i don't know how much detail you want here this could be very boring but i'm gonna go for it go for so, it so i got a very expensive private education and the only job i could find after i graduated was through a friend doing customer service at a personalized company oh boy to pick up the phone and either take down people's personal ads or more often get yelled at them at by them get yelled at by them uh, for their their failures on dates and whatever it was it was excruciating it was like you know like an eight dollar an hour job it it you know it was not what I, I had in mind but this that is a whole other that, cast that we may have to have you come back oh, and talk sure. about <laughs> being a customer flat. service on a person. Like, I want to hear what people said when they were like, oh, I personally, I totally didn't work, and it's your fault because I worded it wrong. You don't. <laughs> Seriously, like, somebody would call and be like, I went on a date with somebody, and she was fat. And you're like, what? <laughs> Dude, you, you got a date. You, you got a date. You're being extra judgmental. Yeah. And how is that my fault? Yeah. I would love it if you I would love it if you stopped using this service because it doesn't sound like you deserve love. Uh, but, <laughs> but that that company, yeah. that personalized company, was owned by the company that did the Phoenix. It was in the same building. And it was a terrible job and I hated it. So after a couple months, you know, I was I just happened to check the the company internet for a job posting, and there was one that I later found out had gone up that day for somebody who worked on the Phoenix's website. And it furthermore turned out that this person had only given one week's notice and they were desperate to fill it. So when they got an email from somebody in the building that said like, hey, you know, I'd like this job, they they interviewed me right away and I got the job very quickly. And, and so the job was basically take the content that is being put in the newspaper and put it on the website. And this being 2003, it was still a very cumbersome process. Like they still made the newspaper yeah. kind, of, kind of in the old fashioned way, not so much like, you know, arranging it with exacto knives and tape, but not much far off from that either. So, so that was my job. And, and because it was a weekly paper, my job was like very busy for two days and then nothing for a couple of days. Um, and one day, really, this is, this is how it happened, is my boss walked into my cubicle and said, hey, do you know anything about video games? You know, the, all of the, the stuff I did when I was in high school, like making my own video game review websites and like writing letters to IGN every day and everything. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I know some, some about video games. It's like, uh, so do you think think we could start putting video game reviews on, on the website? I'm like, yeah, I guess so. He's like, okay, you, you can do that then. <laughs> like, well, like, not, not just put them up, but by the way, could you uh, create yeah, those? Things? It really was. It's like, you're in charge of this now because we're not, again, we're not putting any money into this. We're already paying you. So why don't you go ahead and do this? Uh, so we we started, and uh, as it turns out, this is something that Jason enjoys. The, the whole reason that this came into being is because uh, Jim Murray, who is a radio personality here in Boston at the time, worked for WFNX, and at one of their events, best music poll, something like that. He had cornered the vice president of the company and said, you know, made a very compelling case, I think, while drunk. Like, you gotta do video games, dude. You're missing out. This is important. You're supposed to be cutting edge. Well, and completely sold the vice president of the company on the idea that we should be covering video games, uh, which is why they came to me. So uh, at the beginning, it was like me and Big Jim Murray <laughs> writing video game reviews when we were able to. You know, it, it was, it's actually not that hard to, write to a video game company and say, hey, I want to review your game if you're from a real newspaper. You know, I mean, they would send review copies and we kind of got up and running right away. And that's kind of awesome. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was really cool, especially for for where I was in my career, where I, you know, I was I was still very young and to have this opportunity to do something that I had always wanted to do and not really seriously pursued in any way to have it fall into my lap the way it did uh, was yeah. pretty impressive. And uh, I, about a year after that, um, the 2005 ish they started running them in the paper which was a lot more exposure than there had ever been before and more importantly it meant i got paid for doing the reviews at that point yeah uh, when i yeah when i was doing them just for the web it was job and uh, when i when they went in the paper it was well we're going to pay you standard rates for this and even when i left the phoenix in 2005 to go work at family education i remained as a freelancer for the next uh, eight years until the phoenix closed yeah. So that was that was actually the best of both worlds. It's like I, I moved on to a job that like paid a real salary and had a 401k and I got to keep reviewing video games for the Phoenix. 
That's awesome. Mitch, when, <laughs> when you first started, was it kind of nerve wracking to have your stuff in print? To think about how many people would read it? Oh, okay? yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't even, I don't even know how many people read it, but yeah, I mean, especially my temperament. I, I would say that every single time I, I did it for a decade, and every time I sent in a review, every time I filed a story. I had this sinking feeling like that's it. <laughs> Suck and I can't do it anymore. <laughs> Every not... time. Really? Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, Luckily for Jason, when he submits this thing, he's a, he's the own his own editor, his own yeah. editor in chief. So I'm telling you, the shit so, I put also on my feels way. that. Yeah. Though he also feels that same sinking feeling, he never gets rejected. <laughs> I, I feel <laughs> that. I, I was just thinking about that. I was like, what the? I put up so much. Stuff about myself online is like, wow. Oh, uh, but you should hear my poem this week. It's about voices. I mean, it's 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 because of voice scintillation, not because of my voices. But <laughs> it was because at work, I I I, uh, I went to a hearing voices simulation because I work for uh, for a, a community care uh, company, and um, yeah, we we had we had this whole simulation where we were hearing voices, and I wrote this poem about it. But still, I'm just saying, I put everything. I put very a lot of poetry up on on the website and uh and i put up a lot of content on oddball magazine that uh is like pretty 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 cool it's kind of nice but I, it's, it doesn't go on print so it must be kind of something to to go uh from web to print to be like this is first of all people who don't know the boston phoenix was one of the hottest magazines in boston that was free for some weird reason i don't know how they made that free oh, do, you, do you know the weird reason why why was it free they made the the vast majority of their money from the escort ads. Oh, really? Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. I forgot how big that section was. I oh, remember my God, that. I remember that. That's one of the reasons they went out of business is because one of their one of the biggest advertisers in the escort section like went under or stiffed them or something. And you know, I'm, I'm probably getting the details wrong. I don't want to. I don't want to state a factual thing wrong, but but it's all connected. I mean, it really was a great magazine. It was. Oh, really it was great. Best, it was right? great. They won a Pulitzer. For, for arts coverage, they were on the uh, Catholic Church abuse scandal before the Globe was. I mean, they did oh, they wow. did great work for decades. They were a, a, an absolutely great paper. I I, I remember. Uh, okay, so I had one that said like something about the Beastie Boys, which was really cool. I mean, they had stuff, but I had, I remember seeing one that said "Beware of Google," uh, like ten years <laughs> ago. Uh, well, they were probably right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah almost definitely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it was a, a beware of Google. Uh, so um, that was like 12, 13 years ago, and uh, I mean that was before the privacy laws were so. I mean that was before you know Snowden and all those guys and stuff. So uh, it was, yeah. I mean I always thought the Phoenix was the coolest magazine that I could possibly read for free. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, plus you know the Middle East. Uh, there was always. Uh, the, you know, you could find out what was going on at the Middle East and the, and the, all, the, all the clubs and stuff. And it was, it was awesome. Plus, the articles were great. Plus, I knew you, Mitch. <laughs> and I was like, my friend Mitch is in this. In this uh, 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 your, your, your brush with glory there. It's my only brush with glory, Mitch. <laughs> I'm holding on to it. <laughs> uh, Mitch, let me ask you this. When you were, you know, starting out your writing career and you're at the Phoenix and you're, you're – uh, you know, doing the, the job of putting stuff online and, and aspiring to be a writer. A, obviously, you probably did not imagine writing that that your legacy would be writing for children's media. What was it that you were, you know, what was your dream writing job at that point? I, you know, I think that I hoped to make a living out of reviewing video games or covering video games. Yeah. Um, because you know, again, my my dream job as a, as a teenager was to work at IGN, probably, um, and, and you know, to be honest, as the decade went on, it started to seem much less appealing to spend my whole life doing that. And uh, I, I don't know, I don't know how, I don't know how <laughs> you guys are to the, the general discourse surrounding video games, but it's it's kind of dire. It's it's kind of I, there. There was a thought at the beginning that. You know, oh, I can make it better. I can contribute, and, and and what I always wanted to do was be that that writer about video games that people would turn to, maybe even if they didn't really like video games. You know, I would always think about, for instance, whether it was an old movie or whatever. I would 
then after I watched it, I would go see what Roger Ebert had to say about it. Yeah, because I, yeah. I just loved Roger Ebert and, and I always wanted to know whether I agreed with him or not. I wanted to know what he had to say about the movie. And I, I always kind of wanted to, you know, I would aspire to that. Like, I, I want to be a conversational partner with people. I don't want to tell them the day it comes out, yes, buy it or don't buy it. But if somebody plays this game, I would love for them to sort of feel like I need to have this conversation with Mitch about it, you know? And and whether or not that happened, I have no idea. But it, it started to seem like that was kind of impossible because that's not what people, at least people who talk about video games on the internet, are interested in doing. So yeah, Mitch, you published in Slate um, a while back ago. Well, I don't know how long ago it was, but you're um, one of the things you you wrote about was. Um, I mean, you didn't take video games to like, oh yeah, like this 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 part of this game is really cool. You, you, your, your article was, it was on Modern Warfare 2, and it was like, uh, the airport scene from yeah. Modern Warfare 2 is needlessly, uh, it, it's, it's needlessly over the top, and for this reason. Yeah. Uh, so, why did you take that perspective, instead of like, you know, on, on, on level 2, you can beat this, <laughs> by, you know, jumping over, the, jumping over the box and hitting the castle, you know, obviously I don't play video games that much, <laughs> But you know, <laughs> it's like okay. wait, wait. You think you think that was obvious? <laughs> I don't know if you remember me talking about how I got my stove repossessed. But uh, the other thing I, I'm not good at video games is because they're so freaking hard, like to shoot the guns and stuff. You know what I mean? Like the first person shooters, those are very difficult. I was always that one person who was standing up at the sky, shooting at the sky when someone would like sneak up and like yeah, cut my head off, spinning in a circle. That was me. I. I yeah. I've never gone online playing a video game because I'm afraid of being rejected. That's why I don't play uh, video games. You're probably right to do so. When, when you get <laughs> when you get completely owned by a kid whose voice hasn't changed yet, and you That's know funny. that he's right. Yeah. Like, All right. <laughs> yeah, you got me. Right. I, I've, I've seen I've seen my friends Conrad and TJ play uh, uh, Grand Theft Auto, and um, you, it gets pretty. It, I mean, the online content. I mean, when you're you're talking on the, you know, it's like. You're getting, it's pretty it's pretty bad. I mean, I don't know. People are yelling <laughs> at you. Like, look at this guy. He's standing in the corner shooting in the sky. Go and cut his head off. You know, that like I was not good at video games. I'm still <laughs> not good at video games. Um I, I would if, if if watching TV had like remote con oh, it does have remote control. Never mind, that doesn't make sense. If it had like a controller, <laughs> you know, like like you know, I had to go up, down, left, right, B A, B A. You know, I mean I'd probably have trouble turning the TV on. But um, what were we talking about? Yeah. I, uh, I was, how, I was, how TV would benefit from a remote control. Somebody needs to invent that. Some, <laughs> some manner of control for the television. If only. <laughs> if only I didn't have to get up to switch between my three channels. <laughs> I know, right? My antenna. But I did want, I, I did want to kind of – I know we got to wrap up, but that idea of um, how you took unusual perspectives on video games. Yeah. So there, there's a few things – about that. Um, one is just simply, why write about something if you're going to say what everybody else is saying? Absolutely. You know, you know, and, and I always I always thought that way. Like, I never thought my job, as the person who's got 600 words in the Phoenix, my job is not to do the comprehensive, here's a look at every aspect of this game that you might get from, you know, like a big, like a game spot or an IGN where they have the space, and yep. that's what their audience is looking for. I, I would much rather dig into one element of the game and really, you know, explore it, really talk about it, uh, which is what some people like and some people don't. And what's kind of odd about video game discourse is that, you know, if you're talking about a movie, for as much as people argue with each other about movies and people say this movie is for audiences, not critics, whatever, like everybody who watches the movie sees the same movie. If you play a video game, you didn't necessarily... I mean, I, I guarantee you, you didn't have the same experience as somebody who played that game. I mean, Call That's of Duty, point. for example, you know, I, I played it for the story, uh, for you know, for good or ill. I did play the online mode, but it you know, it didn't do much for me. Whereas a ton, the vast majority of players who play a Call of Duty game, we know for a fact, don't ever play the single player version. They just right. play multiplayer. So th we're not talking about the same game. When right. I'm complaining about something that happened in the story, and there's like, dude, I'm just playing multiplayer for hours. I love it. You know, we're like, we're, we're no good to each other, and, and and we're mad at each other about that. And that's why talking about video games can be so frustrating. 
Yeah, but is it kind of a it's kind of a society where people are like, yeah, I've played Modern Warfare two, and this is how I feel about it. And then there's people who are like, I don't really know how to play Modern Warfare two. <laughs> and in a way, the people who know how to play Modern Warfare two are so much cooler than the people who don't know how to there, play Modern Warfare two. There's still a, a defensiveness and a tribalism even today among Plus, people who play video games. Like they want they want to be able to say I. I belong here and you don't, and that's a weird and toxic thing. Isn't there like Modern what Modern Warfare Two is a very old game? I'm, I'm guessing at this point, yeah, I want to say like 2009, something like that. So, so it'd be like playing Madden 2012. This is not, yeah. not the same thing. So, how many Modern or, Warfare or 2009? <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> that's part of the game I got a game. Yeah. Well, I, I got those, two Bledsoe as my quarterback. I can update those rosters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Drew Bledsoe is my quarterback. That was a, that was a joke I threw out there. Yeah. That's pretty. Funny. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so how many modern warfare's are there? Just I mean, well, they, there's there's usually a Call of Duty every year. I think, yeah, no, there's one every year. Is modern warfare and Call of Duty the same thing? Yeah. So yeah. Co- modern warfare was a Call of Duty game, oh and then God. it was so big that they made. That. Yeah, and you know, uh, another why? thing, another thing that gets tiring about reviewing video games is if you get sick of playing Call of Duty every year and it keeps coming out. But, you know, the audience isn't sick of it. But as a critic, you know, as somebody who has to play it, you do kind of get sick of it. You know, I, I do enjoy the game I'm playing right now. It's very funny. I like funny video games. Are there other funny video games besides the South Park game that I'm playing? Maybe that's what I think. Maybe video games are too, I don't know, serious. Well, like, so here's South the great thing. Funny. The first game that Prof mentioned on this podcast was... Monkey Island. Yeah. That, is, that is a game you can easily play on your computer, and I think on Xbox and PlayStation. That's a hilarious game. And the, the creator of that game just came out with a new one a couple months ago called Thimbleweed Park, which I have not played, but is a throwback to that style of game. There, there are funny games. Just got to know where to look. Okay, that's I like to. I like a list of funny games. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Monkey funny Island. Game. Start with Monkey Island. Monkey Island is a lot of fun. Man, I haven't thought about that game until there was something in. Uh, as I was browsing the Pop Tropica website, that made me think of that. That I went, "Oh man, this really reminds me of uh, of playing that game." And that was one of the first experiences I had with like RPG or uh, you know or puzzle type games. Uh, and like I said at the beginning, that that's a, a lifelong uh, thing for me. I, I've always loved those, and I think there's something particular to it that is a different experience than like first person shooter or uh, other types of video games. You know, even even Madden. I love Madden, but it's obviously a very different experience. It's difficult climbing inside of a uh, of a puzzle game. Uh, mm. So to bring it full circle, I really do think that's an awesome and very not just unique, but very worthwhile thing to to um, put out into a children's market. I think it's it's really really interesting um, and really. I mean, it, it, if I were uh, a ten year old, I would be a, a Pop Tropica fiend. You know. Uh, which is not to say that I won't tomorrow, you know, sign on, yeah, get myself a membership, and yeah. <laughs> so Mitch's dream was to be a video game uh, reviewer, and he became a video game reviewer. Now he's uh, play- now he's one of the writers for one of the best pop, uh, hottest pop, uh, hottest video games out there for a certain age bracket. That's pretty crazy. So what's uh what's next there, Mitch? What's what's next for Pop Tropica and Pop Tropica Worlds? How where will you be? Uh, expanding next what have you guys been thinking about uh, we are absolutely focused on getting pop tropica worlds built up as much as we can as quickly as we can which means uh more new islands more new stories for kids to play we're also going to do some remastered versions of classic pop tropica islands with some new features on them and a lot more customization a lot more costumes and uh, decorations for your home we're uh we're now that we have the game up and running now that it works we're going to do our best to put as much content in there as quickly as we can. Is there a movie on the way? <laughs> I hope so. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, I, we're still, our, we still have a dream to get an animated series, but we'll see if that ever happens. Oh man, that would be, that'd be really cool. Um, well, as we said a couple minutes ago, we, t- we fly through the oddball show hour when this is going fun and when we're having a really interesting conversation, we have, you know, blown right through the hour and we've got a little extra, which is, which is great. Um, before we move on to closing out with uh, with Jason's jagged thought, Mitch, where can uh, our very interested listeners find information on you and on Pop Tropica? 
All right, well, Pop Traffic is easy. It's just poptrafica.com, P-O-P-T-R-O-P-I-C-A.com. Probably our, our worst decision was making something that's hard to spell. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm easy enough to find, although not terribly active online. Uh, I have a Twitter account, which is at M-K-R-P-A-T-A. Again, not that easy to spell. And uh, my personal website is www.writemitchwrite.com. Uh, please click the affiliate links and buy my books. Awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> well, our thanks uh, to Mitch for, for being here on the Audible Show Hour. It's been a, been a lot of fun, and uh, I am very interested to, to dive more into Pop Tropica. And I'm really especially interested for uh, – where it is in you know in seven years when my when my infant you know it's time to, to get himself get himself behind a keyboard so um, thanks very much for for, for uh, producing and presenting interesting material for kids uh, yeah our appreciation for being here thank yeah. you for having me I appreciate it I think I think Mitch is one of our interesting guests because he you know the, the whole Boston Phoenix thing the pop shop I mean this this is a great guest to have on the program. Yeah, I didn't like him. Yeah, he was okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are the Oddball Show. You can find us on, uh, this is feeding right now through Google Hangouts and into YouTube, so you can find it live there. And then through the power of the internet, it's also on our Twitter feed, our Facebook feed, on both of the websites we mentioned earlier, jpdimeproductions.com and Oddball Magazine. And then it goes from there to SoundCloud and then from there onto iTunes and, and Stitcher. So you can find the Oddball Show a lot of different places, wherever your social media um, spirit lends itself. Please come and find out. Give us give us comments. Uh, and if you have an idea for a guest on the Oddball Show, please do not be shy about hitting us up on, uh, especially on Twitter at JP Lime and at Oddball Magazine. I am at Doctor Prof Esquire, and he is at Man the Storm. Uh, Jason, why don't you take us out of here with a, a jagged thought? All right, all right, all right. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mitch, for being on the show. Uh, we've had a pleasure having you on there, and. Um, uh, Let's let's close off tonight uh, with uh, a poem that I wrote. Um, I wrote it at a hearing voices simulation where I was listening to what it would be like to hear voices and um, the aftermath of hearing the voices and then taking off the headphones and, and how, kind of how that resonates with you. So um, this is my poem. I'm going to close off the, tonight. Uh, here it is. Jagged Thought 180, Voices. A response to the hearing voices simulation. Evil or innocent, can't tell yet, coughing or laughing, these haunted residents. My eyes blink heavy with this new energy, people all around me in this waiting room waiting. I feel calm for a second, they are laughing, growling, and I sit here waiting, wondering what's next, when will they stop? This section of my frontal cortex, she says, I lead the way. She says, I'm the one. She says, I'll be fine. She comforts me eases this new confusion. She says, I am chosen. Everyone reading these outdated magazines in this waiting room, and all I hear is laughing, chaotic voices in stereo. Those voices, they were new to me, but I took the headphones off and they remain only memories. They don't stay with me like the end of a bad movie or the crag of a cliff, obtrusive, protruding. When I took my headphones off, the voices stopped, but some the laugh track keeps skipping and some of the static never stops. But me, I was just a witness. I could turn the voices off. That was Jagged Thought 180, Voices. And this has been The Oddball Show. Come back next in two weeks when we have our guest on the program, Eliza Williamson from NAMI. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. The Oddball Show, a podcast of collaboration. Keep me by production. They are